So put your hands together, everybody, for Pastor Tanisha as she comes to preach. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. I mean, we can. I mean, I'm here for it. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon. How are you today? I just want to start with, um, let's just take a moment in prayer. The presence of God, of God has been so beautiful here. Did, have you felt his presence and his spirit? So, Lord, we just want to, we just want to rest in your presence just for a little bit. It is the anointing that lifts the burden and destroys the yoke. So, God, we welcome your anointing in this place. There's people in here with heavy things, heavy hearts, heavy situations. God, will you lift that this morning? God, there's people here with yokes, yokes of bondage, addictions, mindsets, paradigms. Lord, will you destroy the yoke? It's only your anointing that could do that. So we welcome you in this place, oh God. If you need something lifted or destroyed, can you just lift your hands in the presence of the Lord? God, we are here. We are waiting on you. Thank you, oh God. You are so wonderful. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. God is so good. All right, family. We're going to, uh, we've been in our series of the ties that bind. Um, it's about us deepening our relationships with one another, entering into healthy relationships. I mean, you know, we need some healthy relationships. We have enough dysfunction in our lives thus far, and now it's time for us to move on to an emotionally healthy part of our lives. Um, if you weren't here at 9 o'clock, Pastor Ernest spoke a beautiful word about us growing and maturing in God. Go back and listen to it. It was amazing. Um, but today we're going to take a little turn, and y'all got to put your um, seatbelts on with me because it's going, it's, it's, we're going for a ride. Y'all ready? Y'all can't leave me out here by myself. We're going all together as a group, as a community. Today we're going to talk about uh, decolonizing our relationships. We're going there today. We ready. I, I, put, I told you to put your seatbelt on. You didn't. We're going to talk about decolonizing our relationships. If we're going to start anywhere with where we are and our emotions and where we are presently standing, we got to go back to the root. We're going to go digging up some stuff today, all right? So y'all with me? All right, here we go. So it's no surprise about our history. I, I'm not a professor. I'm not a history uh, major. or I'm not, I, won't, I won't insult your intelligence about the history of our country. It's no surprise that we come from a colonizing culture. That this is a culture and a land that is not ours. For a lot of us people of color, this land is not ours. For indigenous people, this land is yours. And we've been raised in a culture that has, that's been given to us, but it's not our own. It's not our own. Definition of colonizing, the action or process of settling among, I'm sorry, the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area and to use their domain for one's own use. This is no, you know, we know our history, we know this is where we come from, we know that we've been brought up in a colonizing type of society, but there is a problem with that. Even though we are free and liberated on today, there is still a problem because we have been formed in this environment. We have been formed in this culture. Dare I say we have been formed in whiteness. Now before we get too tense, white people in the room, I'm not talking about you and I'm not talking about white people, I'm talking about whiteness. White supremacy, whiteness is the notion that everything white is right, and anything black is whack. 
right? Anything, anything white has value. Anything that's not white does not have value or has lesser value. So that's what we're talking about when I say whiteness. Are we all on one accord? All right, we have all been formed by whiteness. And a lot of people of color, we really have to come to terms with this. We have to look in the mirror and look at this dead on and face to face to really accept the fact that I have been formed in this culture of whiteness. You can wear all the daishikis you want. You can put on all the hoop earrings and the bamboo earrings on. You can wear all your things, that are, but they're <laughs> not pointing out anybody. I didn't even see you, Jermaine. Sorry. Spirit of prophecy is in the room. <laughs> you can do all the things. Oh, 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 what are we doing? Hey. Oh, oh, we got shit. Uh, no matter, oh, don't take it off. No, just kidding. <laughs> Call out culture, sorry. But we can do all the things and we still need to recognize at some point that we have been affected by this culture that has been given to us. It bleeds into every area of our lives, even our relationships. And we've been talking about expectations. If you are in live groups, we've been talking about expectations. What are, you, what are you expecting out of relationships? And sometimes our expectations are a little off, which makes us go into a little bit of bitterness because we didn't get what we expected because we didn't really clearly communicate it. It's a whole thing. But sometimes our expectations have been formed by culture. And sometimes we're expecting things from a culture that we've been raised in and formed in um, that and we don't even know where, where these things coming from. I kind of, um, uh, I'm glad Talia's here. Uh, she's a baller. I used to be a baller. <laughs> not, on, not on Talia's level, but you know, when, when, you're, when you're young, you remember being on a playground, anybody else play basketball? Pastor Mike doesn't believe I play basketball, by the way. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, when you're young and on a playground, you're just kind of throwing anything up there, right? You're just like heaving it, you know, God forbid you don't. But you're just doing it. No form, no nothing. But unless someone has formed you, you'll just go into your high school years, your adulthood years, still shooting crazy, right? When really, you know, come on, Tal, it's proper form, feet balance, uh-huh, elbow, yep, yeah, uh-huh, fun. That's all, that's money all day. Let's go. Hey, you ready? I'm still, I'm, I'm not playing Tal you one-on-one, I tell you that. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but that's being formed until you're formed. If you're not formed, you just go out here shooting any old kind of way. Being in any old kind of relationship, acting any old kind of way. Right? Um, there's a great quote um, that I wanted to throw up by our good friend, Junio Diaz. We love him. He has such a good, a good quote about, he said, um, there's an old saying the devil's greatest trick is that he convinced people that he doesn't exist. Well, white supremacy's greatest trick is that it has convinced people that it, if it exists at all, it exists always in other people, never in us. Now sit, let's just sit in that for a minute. Because we, we you know, we're in call out culture right now. I'm, you know, get me on a good, Instagram feed, I might be a part of call out culture. Catch me on a good day. Um, but sometimes we like to call out white supremacy. We're talking about it all the time. But it's hard to see that it's in us sometimes, that we've been formed. And it's hard to admit that sometimes. Like, I got pride. No, I no black power or power to the people. But there's some. Things that are in us, it's kind of like, have you ever, you know, I'm sure you have, have you ever like stepped in dog poo? And you walk into a room and you're like mad at everybody. Like what is, who, where is it? And it's a room full of people so you really can't locate it until you realize it was, it was me the whole time and I'm going around mad at everybody. This is kind of what it is. A lot of times we're smelling things, we're looking at things, things aren't quite right, things smell and, and it's just all messed up. But sometimes it's leaking maybe out of me. Maybe it's, maybe it's coming out of me. 
Junio Diaz also said, people of color fuel white supremacy as much as white people do. That is something that we are all implicated in. Just sit in that for a minute. I know it's hard, it's hard. It's a hard spill as well because we feel like we're down for the cause, right? <laughs> like we're here for every protest. But I think until we come face to face with how we've been formed in this culture, that we can't really go forward into healthy relationships sometimes unless we see what we working with, all right? Y'all ready to see where we, I didn't lose none of y'all. Y'all good? We good? We doing this together, remember community. All right, um, I just wanna, um, there's a great website that a friend of mine told me about. It's called dismantlingracism.org. Don't look it up now. I will walk down these aisles and take your phone out of your hand. I will go teacher on you. Don't pull it up now but afterwards, and um, it, it gives some, some um, great points about what does white supremacy culture look like? And there's just a few points that I, that I took out of this, but I wanna just go over these things with you all. What does white supremacy culture even look like? How have we been formed? So here's just a few little bullet points about what white supremacy culture looks like in our, in our everyday society. First of all, there's perfectionism. Making a mistake is confused with being a mistake. We're always reaching for perfection. Also, there's always a sense of urgency. There's always calendars, memos, things to do, day timers, but like we're always trying to be on schedule. Continued sense of urgency that makes it difficult to take time to be inclusive, encourage democratic, or uh, thoughtful decision making to think long term or consider consequences. Everything is come on, we gotta move now, we gotta make a move, gotta do it now, you gotta, I need an answer now, what we doing? Right? This is all a part of the culture we've been raised in. Another part is defensiveness. Criticizing, criticism of those in power is viewed as threatening or inappropriate or rude. There's always a, a, a but what about? But what about all lives? Don't all lives matter? <laughs> Defensiveness, right? Um, there's the other thing that's um, only one right way. The only belief that there's only one, one, one right way to do things. It's, 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 no, it's, it's not either or, it's black or white, there's no gray, there's only one way to do it, and it's my way. Mm-hmm, 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 y'all with me? All right, and then there's uh, paternalism. Those with power think that they are, are capable of making decisions for and in the interest of those without power. Those with power often don't think that it's important or necessary to understand the viewpoint or experiences of those of whom they are making decisions. Paternalism. Uh, power hoarding. Little or if any value around sharing power. Power seen, is seen as limited. There's only so much to go around. We only got a little bit of power. Everybody can't have it. So we gotta hoard it all, right? And then the last one is a right to comfort. The belief that those with power have the right to emotional and psychological comfort. That is always about what makes me feel good. How, you know, what, what's not interrupting my vibe. Now I want you to look at this list. Now I want you to think about your relationships. And how might any of these things might have affected your relationships currently or in the past? And this is not for guilt, this is for enlightenment, for us to kind of dig a little deeper, go beyond the surface, let's till the land a little bit. Look at all these things. These are kind of things that we have been formed in this here USA. Um, and these are things that, that have molded us and it leaks into our everyday lives and even in our relationships. Now, in relationships, I'm not even talking about uh, re romantic per se. This could be any relationship that you're, it could be, um, you know, your family relationships, siblings, coworkers. It could be a girlfriend or boyfriend. It could be your best friend. Where have we seen these things creep in to our relationships? And I think that's where we have to, to start to deconstruct this notion, we have to decolonize from these ways that have been formed into us. 
right? We have to start constructing. Now, sadly, most colonizers use the Bible to, as an agent to, pro, to, to be a proponent for these things. Sadly, they did. They used, um, you know, they, Christianity as often was the agent, the agent of colonizing. But, you know, praise God that we are in a place where we know we were able to be in a place of truth now. We no longer have to take their word for it anymore. We all have, we, we are able to read now, praise God. And we're also able to study and be scholars. And it turns out that it wasn't their religion in the first place, right? They didn't own or control anything. They just tried to hijack it and we taking it back in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a verse I want to um, show you. How can, what do we do then? We've been formed in this. I didn't even mean to. It was like going to somebody's house. You ever been to somebody's house when they're cooking chicken, fried chicken? You just went in there, just all oh, smelling good, had your little cologne on, staying there for about three hours. And when you leave that house, what you gonna smell like? A good bucket of Popeyes. Everywhere you go, you get on the bus, they're gonna be like, ooh, can I sit by you? You smell good. Right? You didn't mean to be in this culture. It wasn't even, it was very subconscious. It wasn't even something that you did. But um, this is something that we are all in and presently standing in. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? I want to throw up a, a verse, Galatians 5, 13 and 14, I believe is our key to liberation. Amen? I believe God wants to to um, show us a better way. How many people want a better way? You know, the way that we've been doing it in this, in this context, in this colonizing context, it doesn't, it doesn't always work. It's not very smooth. It's a lot of bumps along the way, a lot of hurt feelings, a lot of slamming doors, a lot of hanging up on the phone. Can I get a witness, anybody? All right? It doesn't really work, this colonizing way of love. So what, what, let's see what might be a better way to love. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. I'm sorry, I did say I did white, but I didn't do white, so sorry. <laughs> For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. What is our calling? Have you ever wondered, God, what's my calling? Well, I have the answer for you right here. You have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. I could just walk out right now and say, God bless you, have a good day. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. This is our calling. This is freedom. This is liberation. What we have been taught and what we have been formed in was evil. It was not the truth. And this is our time to, you know, how every generation we are the curse breakers. We are the generational curse breaker. This is our time to stand up. You ever, Pastor Mike says this a lot, like we always say, what we would have done if we were here in slavery or what we would have been doing if Dr. King was alive. Well, guess what? This is your opportunity to stand up and say, you know what? It is for freedom that Christ has set me free. This is my calling, that I will walk in freedom and liberty, and it does start in our relationships. It starts with those closest to you. You could be on the street protesting all day, but when you go home and nobody likes you, nobody wants to talk to you, what does it even matter? Liberating our relationship. Christ came to give us freedom. John 8, 36 says, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Amen. See, this was the scriptures that they didn't want to tell us, the colonizer. They didn't share these verses. They kept these under wraps and said, y'all better not read. Because they knew if we saw that when the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. How many want to be free? Live a, a, a liberated life. Free in your relationships. Just think how you could be, ha everything could be going amazing in your life, but if you're having relationships problems, it just messes the whole thing up. You're like, we could be celebrating now. You are here acting up. We want to be free. Um, Galatians 5 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not 
let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. It is for freedom. Just can you imagine your relationships free? Can you imagine what it would feel like to be liberated and not weighed down by the, the white supremacy culture that we have been bought into, that we have been formed in? What, what does a free relationship look like, you may wonder? I have a couple of suggestions. <laughs> read this great article. You ever read a good article and it was like, oh, this can preach. Like, I really like this article. Um, it was called uh, Five Ways to Radically Exist in Decolonial Love by Philip Ferdale. And it was amazing. And here's just a few points that I just distracted from there. Um, the first thing, if we want to be free, if we want to decolonize our relationships, the first thing we must understand is that relationships are not about ownership. Relationships are not about ownership. The truth is that the very idea that anyone's in a relationship that, and they are owned has very colonial roots, particularly in the sense that colonizers would claim to own land they discovered, talking to you, Christopher Columbus, the thing that the notion of a property that a, a human being could be a property property anyone see Harriet yet? Yes. yes, it was great, right? There's no spoiler where you could just see her and uh, read about her. Just no, but so I could talk about the movie. No, but <laughs> I won't do that. I'm sorry. But there's a key line like there is God never meant for humans to own humans. Yeah. It's never a concept that you will find in the Bible. It was never his perfect will. And we got to look at our relationships. We don't own anybody. We don't own, we don't own one another. This is where we need to get free, that we're going to have liberation. In our, you, you, they're not your property. Even if you're a romantic relationship, parents, your kids, you're raising them. God gave a stewardship over them, but you don't own them. Come on, sit in that. We don't own one another. This is a very colonial ideal, that we own one another. You belong to me. I'm yours. You mine. You my man. You my woman. <laughs> don't nobody better not be looking at my woman. <laughs> like, why, well, sir? We don't own one another. <laughs> Relationship is not about ownership. We have to come to a point where we are free. So... What's our takeaway? Decolonial love looks like using language in relationships that doesn't reduce your partner to a piece of property. How can you acknowledge mutual agency? Our pastor has been talking a lot about mutuality. Relationships are about mutual giving and a taking, not a taking and a taking and a taking. Because what does that sound like? colonialism, just steadily taking, 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 never giving, taking, taking, taking. But this is how we were formed. So we have to deconstruct these things inside of us and say, no, no, it ends with me. I will not perpetuate this. Amen? Do I have amen? amen. All right. Second way, if you want to be free and have liberated love, doesn't that sound great? Liberated love? That should be a t-shirt. Maybe I'll make that next month. Come on, let's do it. Let's go into business. All right. You don't always get what you want, and that's just fine. So can y'all see that? I'm going to get some water. Let y'all sit. Sit with that. Thank you. You don't always get what you want, and, 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 and that's going to have to be fine. I'm going to say it one more time. You don't always get what you want. Tell your neighbor, and that's just fine. Tell them. You could tell them because we didn't say touch, so you could tell them. It's important to understand that you are not entitled to having all your wishes granted in your friendships and relationships, and you're not always going to get what you want. If you 
go into a relationship or pursue friendships with unfair or unrealistic expectations, you can't be upset when those expectations aren't met. Y'all want me to say it again? I will. No, I was like, just kidding. Yeah, we're not entitled. See, entitlement, what's that a part of? Colonialism, manifest destiny. This is our land and we are here and doing God's purposes and we're just gonna take over everything. That's entitlement. So when it comes to our relationships, guess what? You don't always get what you want. You're, you don't always, your way is not the way all the time. You're not always right. I'm not always right. I'm not always the one with the great answer. I'm not always the one who comes up with the plan. You don't always get what you want. And sometimes you got to be okay with that. Just let that sit sometimes. We reach, you know, capitalism, which is a part of colonialism, tells us that we have to reach, we got to achieve, we got to earn, we got to buy, we got to, you're only really important if you have a little money in your pocket, you flashing something, you got something on your feet, you got, you pushing something. That's the only time you're really important. You're just an average person, you know, you're not really that important. See, that's all this mindset that we've been brought into. But it's okay, sometimes you don't get your way. That's part of life. And that's gonna be fine. But when you don't get your way, I'm curious as to how, how do we react to that? Yeah. What is our reaction? Pastor Ern has such a good um, message more about us growing up and getting out of this toddler stage of our, of our faith. How do we not throw tantrums as an adult when we don't get our way? And it might not be an all-out fallout like a little kid, but it, it, it look ugly. Like we do, things get, mm-hmm, we do stuff. And when we don't get our way. But it's, it has to be just fine. Um, our next slide, decolonial de love looks like an equitable understanding of each other's wants and needs. How can you keep your relationships from unfair expectations? Y'all still buckled in because I told y'all I was going to get a little. All right, let that sit for a minute. How can you keep your relationships from this unfair, unfair expectation that everybody won't meet all your needs all the time? Guess whose job that is? The Lord Jesus. He's the only one who can satisfy your soul completely. He's the only one that can give you everything you ever want or need in a relationship. He's the only one that can hear and listen to every cry and want to sit and listen to all your stories all day. He's the only one. And he's ready to do it and happy to do it. All the things. All right, so um, let's, let's be okay with not getting our way all the time. That's for me, I'm an only child. Anybody else grew up an only child? Yay, only children, no one understands us. <laughs> See! You know, we don't get our way all the time and that's a foreign concept to us. But um, the Lord is working, yes. The Lord is moving. Slowly, progress, yes. <laughs> yes, God, yes. Okay, and our third point. Um, not only do you not get what you want, you don't always get who you want. I should have had a tea. I should have had a tea cup. <laughs> Thanks. The issue lies in the negative and aggressive reactions to that rejection. When people feel that they are entitled to that another person's affection. This reaction has had many ties to our societal co colonial legacy, primarily through its similarities to the way colonizers would react to people who deemed their property, who deemed that they were their property when they would try to escape from their imprisonment. Colonizers felt that it was their natural born right or destiny to hold ownership over indigenous and enslaved people. 
when indigenous or enslaved people would stand up to their colonizers and fight for their rights over the years, colonizers refused to acknowledge their intelligence or agency and would react in aggressive, also often directly violent ways. How do you act when rejection is present? You don't always get who you want. And I feel like we need to sit right here for a minute, saints of the Lord God. That is a tactic of colonialism to say, whoever I want, I get. I like you, therefore you should like me. And if you reject my advances, then you're going to feel the wrath. We got we got to get out of this anti I mean this this rape culture that has been formed in us through colonialism. Take what you want. I don't care if you, you know, don't you know who I am? Like no, nobody says no to me. Or um, the Lord told me that you were totally going to be my husband. So when are we going to dinner? And I'm not going to give up because this was a word from the Lord. So I will continue to pursue until you return <laughs> my advances. See, this is all a notion that we've, been, that we've been formed in. You get what you want. I set my sights and that's who I get. And if I name it and claim it, then you will be mine. But you don't always get who you want. And that's okay. And that's when you have to lean and depend on the Lord. Be like, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with who you want me to uh, share my life with. I trust you with who you want me to partnership. I didn't get a, 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 a really a vote on my family. So I, I trust that you're going to give me the grace and the love and the patience to be in these situations. Because you don't always get who you want. Even when you make a commitment to someone, that doesn't mean you get to go and pursue other options because but I want that person but no you made a vow so you got to stay right on over here and God will give us the grace to do it amen amen so um, you don't always get who you want decolonial love looks like accepting rejections as a part of everyday life not as a loss of property you felt entitled to control. So the question is, who do you need to let go? <laughs> oh, good answer. His boo is standing sitting right there. Girl, you just got some points. To good answer, brother. That's good. Yeah, it is said that self-determination is the opposite of colonialism. It's the power to be able to choose, right? That, that's the whole goal. That was supposedly why they came here, to be able to have a, a sense of self-determination. We could do what we want, where we want, and however we want to do it. But if, uh, in order for us to combat this notion, we have to give people the power to choose. Somebody say power to choose. This is so important, and this is a concept that really, I think is so beautiful. Um, this is one of our last verses, uh, Genesis 2. Um, I love this verse. In my opinion, this verse is the most beautiful verse after John 3.16. You guys know what John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, use this at football games and, you know, things like that. But in my opinion, this verse is second to John 3, 16, if we're going to talk about verses on love. And I'll explain to you why. It says, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may freely eat, you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. This is the most beautiful love verse, in my opinion, after John 3.16. Because love's not really love unless there's a choice. There's no real love if there's not a choice. This is the beauty of our God. This is the security of our God. Because I tell you, if this was me, this whole little thing would have went all wrong. I'd be like, no, y'all going to listen. You're going to do what I say. Matter of fact, y'all just be robots. Here, follow me. Like, and we just go around and we'll just love God. We love God. We love God. With no will, no choice, no, that we'll just, we'll just follow God because that's what he, if that's, if he's some kind of guy who was into uh, his ego, he'd be like, I'll just make a bunch of people who will worship me. Cool. But that's not what he did. This is so, this is so key and so beautiful. That's not what he did. Instead, he made human beings. He put them in the garden. He gave them a choice. Now, look at here. Here's a choice. You can listen to what I say. Think about this. Of all the trees, think of all, you know how many trees, you know how many fruit trees there are? You know how many fruit, how many species? There's so many fruit trees. Of all the trees, you can free, freely, he didn't even like cashing up, give me a dollar for it, no. But this one, this one tree, I don't want you to touch it. Because you, when you touch it, you, you, you'll surely die. Gave him a choice. That is the most beautiful display of love. Love gives a choice. So how does this translate into our lives? You gotta let, you gotta give people the choice to choose you. You gotta give people a choice. You gotta give your kids a choice to listen or not. Now there's consequences. There are clearly consequences that were spilled out, right? He was like, so, if, but if you eat it, you're gonna die, so. That's a consequence. So this doesn't mean you just let people come in and out of your life and do what they want. No, you need boundaries and consequences. So if you do X, Y, and Z, we, are, we done, right? But there's something beautiful in allowing people the freedom to choose you back. Parents, well, after you formed your kids and instructed them, that at some point we have to let them go and let them make their own choices and not hover over them like we're God. God didn't even do that. He's not hovering. He was not at the tree like, what y'all doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, y'all about to touch that fruit? Oh, okay, okay, I, 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 what I say? Like, he wasn't even, like, there. He was not, like, and this goes, boy, well, Holy Spirit, this goes for our relationships, you know, in our investigative works, <laughs> in our relationships. <laughs> you know, that, that, <laughs> that need, you know, just to take a couple of scrolls through an unlocked phone, See what they've been up to. <laughs> and let me get that cold though. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things that we are doubling back on people, checking in on them, making sure, I'm, you know, I'm just making sure everybody on the up and up and straight and narrow, like checking up on people. No, 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 no. This is us being liberated in our relationships and giving people the power to choose right or wrong, independent of you. Because real love will choose you over a million other choices. That's real love. So this is where our relationship with God, this is so deep because that's what he's offering to us. He did not make us robots. There's nothing in this whole universe that God is keeping tethered to him. Like even angels have free will. They could walk out of heaven, apparently, anytime they want to. That's what the devil did. Like, oh, I'm going to be God. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I created you. So there's no, God's not holding anybody hostage, which is so beautiful because he wants us all to choose him. 
That's so beautiful to me. So when you come to God and worship, you're saying, God, I got a million other choices. I could be so many other places today. I could be doing so many other things. But you know what, God? I choose you. What will you do with your free will? Will you choose him? Will you choose him over him? Because that's what he gives to us. He gives us the option to follow him or not. But there's consequences. But you got a choice. He's such a great God. He's so loving. He's so kind. So how will, will you let the people in your life choose you? Let them free. Set people free, y'all. Set them free. Let set your kids free. Set your partner free. Set your mom and dad free. Set them free. Sometimes you need to set them free to see what they're going to choose. Because if you keep them caged up, anybody stay in a cage. Let people let go. Go and see. Go and see what their heart is. Go. On. But a lot of times the insecurity in us wants us to believe that there's a scarcity narrative, but there's no scarcity in love. There's no scarcity in love. There's no scarcity in power, all those things. So as I close, the last verse I want to bring up is Romans 12 and 2. It says, um, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is us saying no to all the colonizing ways that we have been formed. This is us saying, you know what, I don't want to be conformed to this world system any longer, but I want God to renew my mind. I want to now think in a more kingdom or kingdom mind frame of thinking where everything is opposite down is the way up if you want to you know give if you want to find your life you got to give it away you want to be great you got to serve you got to and all these things are so opposite and counter culture to what they're trying to sell us this is us rejecting that like nah i don't have to choke hold nobody to love me <laughs> i don't gotta stalk nobody to love me either you gonna love me or not like I don't have to hawk my kids down and make sure they live and right. Let them, set them free. We are decolonizing our relationships. We are decolonizing. We're done with what they're trying to feed us. So as a, a wonderful prophet once said, I don't know what band it was. Maybe it was you too. If you love somebody, set them free. If you love someone, set them free. Let them go. Turn them over to God. Trust God with your relationships. Trust God with your mom. Trust them with your, with your partner. Trust them with your romantic life. Trust them. Give, them. give it to him. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, because we've been brought up in this colonizing uh, culture, we got to remember that we can't colonize God. So we try, to, we try to bring him down to our level and control him or control the narrative of our lives or control the timing or we want uh, comfort at all costs. We want to have all the power and all the say and we try to run him. We can't run. We can't run the Lord God. We are his servants. We are here at his bidding. So we, we need to surrender our lives to him. So let's stand. If you're here, and you've just been thinking about these things, boy, I'm telling you, this message tore me up before it even got to you all. I want you to hold in your heart things. Oh, yeah, we have questions. Where have you seen the effects of white supremacy in your relationships? How can you begin to decolonize your love? How does God and how can we, how does God love and how can we love like him? Can we just sit in that for a minute? That was a lot of information, but I want you to just kind of think of ways that we've been brought up, done, even on that list of things that, boy, we just really grasp and we strive for things. And that's not God's will. He wants us to rest and relax in him and trust him. 
So I want you to think about a person or people or things that you've been holding captive. I want you to imagine yourself just setting those people free in your heart and giving them over to God. The God who's all loving, the God who's all knowing that there's no need to control or own anybody else. That's his job. He loves everyone that you're concerned about more than you could ever love them. Somebody needs to hear that. God loves that person you're so concerned about. He loves them so much more than you ever can. And he's even more concerned about them. And that's his job. Your job, love God, love people. You've been called to freedom. Come on, will you just receive your freedom on today? God, I receive your freedom. Lord, we thank you for the work you did on the cross, the finished work on the cross. God, when you died on the cross, you nailed all these things to the cross with you. You dealt with the sin issue. This is not even something for us to be struggling with anymore. You took care of it all. So we claim our freedom. It is almost as though we are the slaves who are just hearing about Juneteenth, just hearing about the, the proclamation. We didn't even know we were free. But now we have heard your word and we declare that we are free. We are free from holding other people hostage and captive in the, the colonizing ways that we have been brought up. We denounce it. Come on, if you want to deconstruct those things in your heart, can you just begin to lift your hands and say, God, I just, can you just deconstruct? I need to remodel, oh God. I need you to remodel my heart, remodel my mind. Deconstruct all these ways that were not of you. I don't, I don't want to operate in the world's way. I don't want to operate in this country's way of, of normativity. But God, I want to operate by the purposes and the principles of your kingdom. God, I want to operate in freedom. God has called us to freedom. There's nowhere in your life that you are not supposed to be free. There's no, God's will for you is not addiction. God's will for you is not bondage. God's will for you is not for you to be hung up and tangled up and tripped over things and people and finances and things. You have been called to freedom. Come on, receive your freedom today. Just reach up and say, God, I thank you for my freedom. I claim it, I'm living in it, and I will give this freedom away. Think about the people in your life that you need to give the gift of freedom to. Come on, look at them in your mind. Say, I'm setting you free in Jesus' name. It's the Holy Spirit's job to keep people. You cannot keep anybody. You are not the Holy Spirit. You have not been called to be a reminder, to be a, to hover over people's lives, to making sure they're doing right and making sure they're doing wrong. It is not your job. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. So will you relinquish control and say, Holy Spirit, I give it to you. I give you that person. You love them. I give you their choices. I, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to focus on being liberated. So God, we receive our liberation. We thank you for the proclamation that we receive that we have been called to freedom and liberty and love. And we will not go back to those colonizing ways, but we will love one another in liberation. If you're here and you would like prayer, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come. If you want somebody just to touch and agree, you just want, you know, a little more prayer, you want someone to to stand in agreement with you. If our prayer team is here, come on down. So God, we ask you on this day, Lord, free us, free those we're in relationships with so we can be free to serve you more faithfully. Free us for freedom's sake and we'll say thank you, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, pat yourself on the chest. Say, I am decolonizing my relationship. Say that. The colonize. I'm setting myself free in my relationships. Wasn't that a rich, powerful, meaty, thoughtful message? Let's thank God for Pastor Tanisha. Amen.
What an amazing, amazing word from the Lord.